Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Hey, hello, Andrew. Hello, we're back. We are back. I'm, uh, once again, I'm abroad. So bonjour, guten Morgen and buongiorno from multicult, multilingual Switzerland. This is an international programme. Do you want to see where I am? Hang on. For those who are not watching us on YouTube, please subscribe on YouTube. But also, I'm just going to make people I'm jealous. Just showing Andrew the view from my window. And also, this is the first oh, one. Lovely. Having, oh, lovely. gosh. This is the first episode being recorded in front of a live studio audience. Here she is. <laughs> Go scandal mongers. She says, quite right, too. Sorry. Back to the serious business in hand. It's our six-month anniversary, Andrew. Did you know? I didn't know that, but we are celebrating because we're we've we've doing quite well now. People are beginning to subscribe, uh, and people are looking at some of the back back programs. And um, we've got another six lined up. We've got six more starting with this show, and we've just passed fifty thousand downloads. And people who know more about us about podcasting than us tell me that's really good for six months. It means fifty thousand people, or one person, 50,000 times, has watched one of our programmes or listened to one. And so I'm really grateful. Do you want to hear some yeah, new reviews? We're getting feedback, which is wonderful, you know, right. which we like. And, and it gives us a sense of what people want to hear about uh, or, or don't want to hear about. Exactly. Uh, it seems royal subjects are very popular. People uh, love the royals. And, and contemporary scandals. So we're going to be doing a bit more of that. Though we've been, had a very, I think, nice and eclectic mix of, of subjects. That's one of the parts of the attraction, I think, that you never quite know what you're going to hear each week. Well, I think the thing is, if we enjoy it, then viewers might enjoy listening to us. So we should just do what we want, I think, really. <laughs> yeah, yes, follow our instincts, which are, you know, served us well so far with our writing. Um, and I've got a couple of new reviews. It's always my favourite part of the programme. So TJ DOJ from Apple Podcasts of Ireland says, I've listened to every episode, chaps, each one more interesting than the last. A very well-researched and wide range of scandals. Do please continue. Um, and actually, my, my, my um, data, uh, I've got a sort of strange um, link here to Apple Podcasts. We were in the top 20 podcasts of society and politics in Ireland last month. How's that? Great. Gosh, well, that means we need to do more Irish subjects. Well, I guess that's a good Well, we have got an Irish subject today. We have. Respect. Yes, because our very first show six months ago was about Lord Louis Mountbatten, um, highlighting Andrew's amazing, um, groundbreaking and shocking research into his life. And since then, Andrew's done loads and loads more. So we thought we'd go a bit deeper today, um, find out the latest, and, and maybe also go a bit deeper into Mountbatten's own life and his marriage. Um, and how important that was. Um, so I should probably start by saying what's what's new in the last six months? Well, there has been a lot that's new. Um, I'm doing a television programme at the moment on uh, the death of Mountbatten, which still remains a mystery. Um, the files are still closed and they refuse to release them. Uh, uh, another victim of his, a paedophile victim, Arthur Smith, has come forward and is, is bringing a case in the High Court in Belfast. Uh, we're now. I'm hoping for the station program that two of the the victims I talked to are going to speak, and I think you know people are now accepting that this is what happened, and there's more evidence. Chris Moore, who's a very famous journalist who did a lot on Kinkora, is writing a book actually on Kinkora and has got a oh. whole section on Mount Batten, and he's added a, a new material from stuff that he's found. People have come forward over the last few months to me, and indeed to him with stories about Mount Batten, uh, visiting Concora, for example, um, the stories of taxi drivers taking him there. So despite the fact that most of the records seem to have been destroyed or withheld, there are, you can never really hide these stories. There's always someone who knows something who who eventually will come forward. So I think that the, the view of Mount Batten has changed considerably in the last few years. People didn't want to believe these stories. Um, I don't think... You know, his behaviour invalidates some of the, 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 the extraordinary achievements he had in his own life. But it does shed new light on his character and the fact that he had this dark secret at the heart of heart of his life, which must would have jeopardised his career. 
And I think it, it gives a new light, sheds new light on this very open marriage she had with Edwina. Um, I was told by their daughter that she had 16 lovers, 16 or 17 lovers. I found most of them, but there are others still popping up. She discovered the other day she'd had an affair with King Alfonso of, of Spain. Um, so, yeah, one of the exciting things I think you probably find, too, is how people come forward with stories even afterwards. And um, I had one last week. I was lecturing on the Queen Mary and talking about my book on Edward VIII. And the line is that Ribbentrop and Wallace never met. And a man came up to me and said, I, my grandfather was Ribbentrop's chauffeur, and he was always taking Ribbentrop off to meet Wallace. So uh, I think the great thing is even 100 years later, these stories do emerge. Well, let's for those who didn't listen to the original programme, and please do, it's up there on our, on our platforms. Um, let me just give you a quick pricey. Andrew has been working for years on this story. And you mentioned a man called Chris Moore. Well, Chris Moore worked with me on an investigation into this same story, although we weren't looking particularly at Mountbatten. This is when I was at the BBC. We were looking at this notorious King Cora boys' yeah. home scandal where numerous young men and boys were abused over the, over many years. Um, and what Andrew's done is he's, he's connected that and other stories of abuse directly to people coming forward to say Lord Mountbatten, this incredibly famous man, was one of the people who... who um, uh, abused me, I was taken to him, or he came to the home. Um, I mean, is there a clearer picture emerging of how this was uh, was able to continue? You know, he was a famous man, he had a security detail. How, how would he have gotten away with it? Well, I, the, the a lot of the boys were brought to him at Classyborn, his house on the west coast of Ireland, which is where he was killed in 1979. Uh, and I've asked the car logs of the cars coming in because there was a security checkpoint there. They've refused to release them, though they have them. Um, that was, I think, where much of the abuse took place. But um, he was able to dodge his security detail. I think one of the reasons why the security wasn't very good um, and he was able to be murdered was that he didn't want security. He wanted the freedom to travel. Uh, and... Uh, you know, he sometimes was able to, to get rid of his security detail, and he turned up in Dublin one day, and no one realised he was he was there. So this idea that he had a security detail who were monitoring him, uh, uh, you know, I think is is rubbish. But also, as we've seen with Prince Andrew, print, uh, police protection officers don't feel it's their job to, to to judge their 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 person. Their job is to protect them. Uh, but, you know, there are lots and lots of stories emerging that Mountbatten's security at a time of enhanced um, danger. Um, Erin Eve had been murdered in 1979. There'd been an attempt on Alexander Haig's life. That even though he was warned not to go to Ireland in 1979, uh, he went. Uh, and instead of his security being increased, it was dropped. So, for example, there was no one guarding Shadow 5, his boat which is a previous year someone had tried to plant a bomb on, and which is what exactly happened in 1979. Uh, a man called Graham Yule, who was a military policeman, did a security audit, identifying the weak points in his security. And instead of that, uh, that was on July 79, instead of that being followed up, Yule was posted to Hong Kong immediately, uh, and the report was presumably ignored, or possibly passed to the Garda, who had been penetrated by the IRA, and may well that may well have, in a sense, given them their, their some help in terms of their um, their operation. But you know, there are people suggesting that it suited people's purposes for Mountbatten to be killed, and even though, and and they made it kind of easy for the IRA. Gosh, so well, it was very reckless, really, for a man with such a high profile, who was very much identified with the British state, its military history, and the royal family, to live part of the year in Ireland during the time when um, you know people were being attacked and killed all over the place from all sorts well, of military the, groups. The Roma family were banned from going. In fact, I think Prince Charles used to sneak, sneak there quietly. But absolutely, and I think what was also pretty extraordinary is that he put his own family at risk by, by meeting with them there. So that when he was killed, it wasn't just him, it was a grandson, a boy who helped on the boat, um, and other young people. Um, and, and that seems to me very irresponsible. But there was a certain arrogance about Mountbatten. I think this is what's coming out. And this is, of course, uh, affected his approach to Indian independence, that he he suddenly pushed the thing forward he, 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 at a time when it wasn't prepared. 
and that's one of the arguments what led to led to a lot of the um um uh the the the, 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 the brutality in august 1947 so it's um uh you know i think people are beginning to sort of reassess this great man uh and and see that he had some flaws well, I mean, you know, uh, more than a few flaws if your reporting is to be taken seriously, and I do take it very seriously. Um, people who have followed the podcast will also know you've been trying to get, you mentioned these car logs, you've been fighting a, a, a fairly solitary battle, an expensive battle for years now to get material. Have you made any more progress on that? Or are you yes. still stuck? Yes, I mean, it, it's... Well, I mean, one of the the, the scandals uh, about Mountbatten was that we, as taxpayers, paid in effect five million pounds for his personal diaries and letters. Um, uh, they were sold by the family freely. They could have been sold to an American university. They were in fact bought with public funds uh, under the acceptance and loose scheme, which means they should be open by Southampton University in two thousand and eleven. And then, for some strange reason, they were closed on the say so one person at Southampton. Uh, with no checks being done after all this money had been spent, and researchers were told it was covered by a ministerial direction. Um, and I challenged this. Uh, the information commissioner eventually, after threatening contempt of court proceedings against Southampton for their refusal to uh, cooperate with the information commissioner, um, they gave a decision in 2019 that they should be released. And that uh, decision was appealed by the cabinet office, who claimed to have some role with this ministerial direction, and Southampton. Uh, and the matter went to a hearing in 2021. Just before the hearing, the government, uh, the cabinet office said, actually, the ministerial direction does not apply, which is what we'd found. It didn't exist. Uh, it was completely made up. So this was a whole case based on a lie. Uh, and so the case was only, in a sense, done on the basis of freedom of, uh, of information exemptions applied to what uh, was left. Um, 33,000 pages were released in this period just before November 2021, which is the largest ever release of FOI material. And I thought um, that having uh, had this unreasonable behaviour by Southampton, the Cabinet Office, that I would get my costs. But I didn't. Um, uh, so I was left with a bill close to to five hundred thousand uh, pounds, which um, uh, I've, I've been appealing, and I've not been given permission to even appeal my costs. Uh, what was rather suspicious is we had a, a pretty gung ho judge who, in fact, initially ordered Southampton to show him the material so he could make a judgment. Uh, and then mysteriously, he was moved to another case, and another judge was assigned to it who really wasn't on top of the matter. I think the other uh, terrible thing is that the G Cabinet Office in Southampton mounted a review of this material a year before the appeal uh, and found that it was innocent. Ironically, one of the people I talked to for my Mount Batten research had been the weeder who went down there to look at it. So oh. they knew the material was innocent. So this was a battle really about nothing. And if it cost me half a million pounds, what do you think it must have cost Southampton and the Cabinet Office? Well, I of think course, that maybe that's it. Maybe money. It's... Maybe it's not about nothing. Maybe it's about making an example of you and anybody who wants to dig into things that this, you know, what, what can we say? The secret state, the royal family, the security establishment, they just, they just don't want people to know this stuff, clearly. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think this was this was a shot across the bows that, you know, if you mess with us, we'll make life difficult. And of course, financial pressure is the easiest way to do that. I think one of the other shocking things is that this material, uh, which was, as I say, freely bought and sold, um, the Southampton allowed the royal family to come down and look at the material and try and vet the material. And this is part of our theme of the curation of our history, that anything that doesn't suit powerful people is taken out so that people can't sort of see it. And this, you know, it's an irony. Here's Prince Harry leaking stuff from a few months ago, which is very sensitive. And yet historians can't look at documents from 100 years ago. Um, so you're right. It is it is a very worrying trend. It's getting worse. We, we, we're going to be talking, I think, later in the series to Martin Rosenbaum, who's been a great FOE campaigner. But we're going backwards in terms of freedom of information. You know, and I think it, it's, it plays very much to the heart of the relationship between government and the governed. If we don't have transparency and, 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 and truth, then actually we're living in a banana republic. We might as well be in Putin's Russia. 
Oh, well, that's strong stuff. And as we've said before, you know, you're not a natural rebel. I can't see you gluing yourself to the road anytime soon. Um, well, I'm getting there. I might. If that, if that was effective, I would do it. But no, I'm trying to get pressure using, you know, institutions like the Royal Historical Society and others, uh, pressure in Parliament. But people don't seem to realise the importance of this. Um, this is not just, I mean, I'm accused, oh, you just want to make money, um, uh, and people are entitled to their privacy. But let's remember that these diaries were freely sold. Uh, and uh, in fact, this campaign I continued long after my book was out. There was nothing in it for me. In fact, just huge financial penalties. But I thought the, the, the issues were so important that unless one stood one's ground, it would be very easy to pick people off. But I think the sad thing is there aren't more historians who are standing up and saying this is important. You know, people who've got a voice in Parliament or in the in in, in the press don't want to know and i think that's partly because the lobby system that exists where if you behave nicely we'll pass you a few tidbits uh and the troublemakers like us who are really keen to get the real story and to work through the archives are basically um marginalized and often uh, these people are used to 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 um uh criticize us uh for example with Trader king when it came out there were no broadsheet reviews initially even though the previous book had been a sunday times bestseller uh, and that i discovered later was because uh, papers were being briefed there was nothing new in the book and yet there was an enormous amount of new material um so this is the rather sinister element of, of trying to write history in the present day gosh gosh well one of our fa my favorite programs that we did was with Jenny Hocking, who is very much your opposite number in Australia, who got this amazing information out about what the royal family did or didn't know, did or didn't say over the dismissal of Gough Whitlam in 1975. And she fought a fight just like yours. But there was one big difference. She had the support of her judicial system, and it didn't cost her a penny. So why exactly. should Australia be so different, I wonder? Well, I mean, she was lucky she got pro bono lawyers, which uh, I unfortunately didn't get for the Mount Batten case. Um, I, I've got other cases. In fact, there is a, a very good lawyer who has very kindly acted as pro bono for me. We're challenging some of the other elements of, of the Freedom of Information Act. One of them is the, the excessive use of national security to uh, grant exemptions, often when we don't even think that national security is an issue. And one of the problems there, we've, we've just had a case uh, the judgment is, it's much of it is carried out in uh, in camera, i.e. in closed court. And so we don't even know what the arguments are that we're trying to address. Uh, and this, again, is a sign of, of, of a dictatorship rather than the sign of a democracy. But you're absolutely right. You know, the Australians, you know, there's two, that's two very interesting case studies um, uh, of royal interference and, and government abuse of power. Uh, and I just wish the judiciary here were a bit more robust. Uh, we've got a, I've got another case at the moment with the Duke of Windsor's protection file from 1932. And I'm told that if that was released, it would affect the current security of the royal family, which is difficult to believe given the advances in technology ever since. I've actually it's, got the former... It's nearly a century ago, for goodness sake. <laughs> well, I've got the former head of royal security to say that, you know, this is ridiculous. Uh, and, you know, the security procedures now are very different to 32. The file doesn't even cover security, as far as I understand. It's about um, subsistence allowances. But I think one of the, again, the sinister things is that when the judge asked me to produce 20 other files, which I said I had uh, on 1932 protection to show that they were completely innocent, the National Archives and the Metropolitan Police applied for their reclosure. So these these files, which have been available for 20 years, looked at by historians, actually been in television programmes, are now closed to historians on the say-so of this judge and, and the Met. Um, and that's a step backwards. Uh, and you know, there's no evidence that any terrorist has ever gone to the National Archives, ploughed through a thousand pages to discover how to attack the royal family. Um, and so this is one of the sort of things I hope will change in the new reign of King Charles. There will be more transparency about historical records, but also uh, the, the wealth of the royal family. He's talking about a streamlined royal family. Um, but, Do you have any you know, connection? I mean, you're the sort of person, Andrew's quite posh if you didn't know, you're the sort of person who might have a connection through somebody, through a friend or a relative. Do you have any way of lobbying, Charles, that you would share with our... <laughs> I don't. I, don't. I wish. No, I, they're keeping their distance. I think one of the ironies is my first book on John Buchan was the the, the official present uh, present at Christmas by the royal family. 
Um, oh, but I, uh, if they buy, if they buy my books now, they're certainly not uh, they're, they're they're passing brown paper envelopes. I mean, one <laughs> of the fascinating things is uh, I uh, do pick up stories um, just just casually things like having lunch with people who do are well connected, and they will often say, "Oh yes, I know so and so." I'm getting a lot of stuff on Prince Andrew, my new book, from people who 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 knew him or know members of the royal family, um, and so that shows you just the sort of happenstance of, of, of doing research uh, and the chance chance element to it. Well, it's funny. Um, I, okay, one what, what of my best anecdotes about doing this podcast, which connects to what you're saying, is that I, I did that a talk a few uh, months ago. I think you actually gave them my name, Andrew, to some wonderful, redoubtable women um, in a lunch club in Chelsea. And I was going to give them my version of the Diana Charles story, which if anybody has listened to my podcast, I do say some very pointed things about Charles and the way um, that him and his team uh, went out to smear Diana, both before she died and afterwards. Um, and I, I arrived, and honestly, I'm 62, but I was the youngest in the room by about 20 years. And there was these very wonderful, posh old women. And I think the first person I met said, I was very looking forward to your talk, Mr. Craig, because I was at school with Princess Anne. Gosh. <laughs> like that. And so I thought, oh, goodness me. Um, so I, I did give them my talk <laughs> at the end. I said, really very happy to hear some feedback, um, what anybody thinks about what I've said and if I've got it wrong or you think I'm being unfair. And this one at the back stood up and said, oh, no, I think we're all in agreement that Charles behaved like a complete shit. <laughs> and I think well, it's going to what you just said. You know, people aren't scared of this stuff. You know, people want to talk about what really happened and make their own judgments. And, there's, and, and, and I think there's a sort of a natural level of fear if they let the sunlight in, it'll destroy something. I don't think it would, actually. It might make people exactly. understand it better. It's 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 interesting the reaction. I mean, I have a friend from school who I talked to about uh, raising getting some money on the map baton, and he said, "I'm a friend of Princess Anne. I can't, you know, I don't want to give you any money." And I thought, well, you can give it anonymously, and I'm sure Princess Anne probably doesn't even remember who you are. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm I'm meeting tomorrow a, ser- a number of, of admirals to talk about Prince Andrew. Uh, and here are very senior people. Um, you know, sometimes they can be very discreet, but sometimes they want the story out. They're tired of the cover up. Uh, and I think people are much more receptive to the sort of history that we're trying to write than the sort of bland uh, hagiography that's, that continues in in raw biography. Oh, and in some ways, I think people like you, intelligent programs have been one of the great sort of pushes because often you've got the resources to go and interview lots of people. I'm always impressed when I work with TV about just how uh, how much they, 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 you know, in terms of the number of people they talk to and the things that they follow up in a way that I suppose individual authors can't really do. True, very true. So before we move on from Mountbatten, uh, let's get to the juicier stuff. It's such a fascinating life. You know a lot about it. We've never really dealt with the marriage. We've talked about him and the allegations about his private life and abuse and and why that's so difficult to get to, to, to find evidence for uh well to find documents about it you found plenty of testimony um but his marriage i mean what was edwina really like was it a marriage of convenience did she kind of understand he had a sort of secret other life did she care What's the dynamics of that relationship? Well, as you see it? that's very interesting, and I think this is why the diaries and the letters between them were so important to, to have, you know, to be able to see those. Uh, though they came too late for the book, I think it was a love match. I mean, he was accused of being a gold digger because she was, I think, the richest woman in certainly in Britain, if not the world, at the time. She inherited a lot of money from her grandfather Ernest Castle. They were both both very young. I mean, she was um, twenty one; he was twenty two. Uh, and but I do think you know that they um, and they sort of were great romantics and I think you know they they it was a very quick courtship, but they they came to an accommodation. I mean I think the problem was he said that his career came first and and in some ways his marriage second. He was often away, same sort of problems as with Prince Andrew and Fergie, and you know she was as a, a bright rich woman really left with nothing to do except go shopping and have affairs, which you began quite quickly. And she'd had a rather sort of sad upbringing. She lacked any, she, her mother died when she was nine. And I think she looked for this sort of uh, love and support from other men, her, what she called her ginks, some of whom were sexual relationships, some were not. And 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 in some ways, one of the great things about uh, uh, Dickie was he was not a very jealous man. And he, 
uh, or didn't maybe I think he cared, um, but he he was a very generous spirited man. And so she was able to have these affairs, often, I think, trying to get attention. Uh, and uh, the children talk about them since these extra father figures uh, around. So it was very, I mean, it's quite normal, actually, in, in those sort of circles to have affairs, particularly once you've had children. And so they 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 got along very well. I think one of the, I think, symbolic moments was that on one birthday, she was given a pair of gates for their, for their country house with their sort of... Um, uh, different uh, um, coats that's, of arms. That's, that's always my favourite birthday present of anybody's out there. <laughs> yes. What a world, like, what a world they lived in. Sorry, <laughs> pair of gates, darling. Here you are. <laughs> Yes, and they had several several gates to 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 to, to Eris to fill. That's but, Mrs. Um, Craig on the balcony for some gates. For later. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. I know what to give you for Christmas now. Um, but they and he began to take on lovers. They took on lovers of both sexes, both of them. So in some ways, she may not have been surprised. I think one of the things that she was most concerned about, which has come out from these diaries, is that he had a particular kink for women in riding breeches. Um, and particularly when uh, he went riding, he liked to ride behind a woman. And there was a, 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 a someone at Broadlands, the young woman he often used to go out riding with. He often used to go out riding with the wives of of his colleagues. And then the, the, the gilly would take the husbands off fishing and then the wives would come back to Broadlands and he would seduce them while the gilly kept them kept the, the, the husbands away. Um, it does so seem like they, a world, I mean, it seems like a world from a movie. Was it only that rich people in those days had, had the time and the opportunities and the bigger houses to have these affairs? I mean, because... You know the diaries for that period from multiple pe- multiple sources. And, uh, yeah, I think so. And I think there were a lot of it was sort of... a sexual free for all, and without people feeling particularly that there was anything wrong with it. Yeah, I think exactly. I think there was the, the, this, maybe there the frame of mind was very different. It's not a sort of middle class frame of mind. Uh, and as long as you didn't scare the horses uh, and you you had your heir, then um, yeah. and often the heirs weren't necessarily the the, the children of the father. Then that was fine, and I think they were very much part of that tradition, which I have to say does continue to this day. But exactly at Broadlands, you could put people on opposite ends of the uh, the house, but because of the inter- interconnecting doors between the bedrooms, you could actually nip round behind the scenes uh, and um, uh, and go and um, you know see who you wanted to see. But the thing that she got very upset with Edwina was that he took a uh, he basically had a sexual fixation on one of his daughters. Patricia. Uh, and so he was banned from going out riding with her. So there's some very deep uh, very you know, strange. things going on. Um, and I mean, there's an extraordinary letter that he wrote to the younger daughter, P- Pamela, saying, I only love you because you're the sister of Patricia. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 there's, you know, we have to be amateur psychiatrists here. There's, the, there's some very, well, you find it with Diana, you know, they're all quite damaged, these people. Mm. Uh, and I'm afraid that, that and, and you know, a lot of it is down to bad parenting. Uh, and those tr- things continue from generation to generation. Okay, so there's there's affairs with men, with women, with whatever. And mo- most of us would say, well, fine, good luck to them, you know. But then there's another side to it. There's the darker side. His supposed interest in young boys. As, get, as a naval officer traveling the world, but there are lots of opportunities, no doubt, for that sort of thing. Um, and in fact, there were places in Malta and other naval bases that were notorious for it. Do you think Edwina knew about that side of his life? And if she did, do you think she cared? I, I think she must have known um, uh, because so many other people knew. Uh, and I think she clearly didn't care. That it didn't matter to her. Um, uh, you know, she had her own, she was a very independent, free spirited woman uh, ahead of her time. Uh, and you know, I think she she wasn't a hypocrite. She she, she you know she knew the way she, she was behaving. She could hardly judge her husband. Uh, I think th- there was hypocrisy with Mountbatten because he was sacking people from the navy for their for homosexuality. It was actually uh, you could be thrown out of the navy until the beginning of the century, um, and yet he himself was was actually using his position of power to have affairs, for example, with naval ratings. People knew that when, you know, you went out with a picnic with him that, you know, certain things that were expected for afters. And I think one of the shocking things I found was to discover one of his chauffeurs from 1948, still alive in his 90s, who told me that when he took on the job in Malta, he had been told to find out where the male brothel was uh, because Mountbatten would want to go there. 
Uh, and this was from senior naval commanders. So they knew exactly what was going on and turned a blind eye uh, to Mount Batten as a position of power, whereas uh, more junior colleagues were, were being drummed out of the Navy for probably you know, less serious offences. So that's, I think, what's wrong, the double standards that existed. Um, and when they come to, you know, perhaps the most important years of their life, well, clearly he had a very serious and important role in the Second World War, and that also generated a lot of controversy, but he was a great figure. But after that, of course, India, and they go there together, and it's really important that they are great diplomats because they're trying to hold this enormous semi-continent, you know, um, subcontinent together with, with with different factions who are potentially at each other's throats. They have to be charming, they have to be diplomatic. D do you think that the fact that they were such um, kind of outlandishly um, free-spirited, free-loving people affected the destiny of India at that time? Or was it always going to be a little bit like it was with partition? A big question. You may not have an answer. Well, I think that's one of the big questions. Yes. It's one of the, the, no, one, no one has ever found an answer to that. I mean, clearly there was a lot of communal violence before they went, and that was one of the reasons why he felt he had to speed up the process of, of it. Uh, independence but you know there is a lot of suspicion about how close edwina was to nehru this would of course be solved if southampton re uh, released the uh, nehru edwina correspondence which was bought at the same time and they could release on payment of 100 pounds and so well, the big question is why is that material still closed and i think that would also and this is nero so for people who don't know nero was was destined to be the leader of well, he was the leader of the Congress Party, and he was probably going to be the commanding figure in the New India, whether it was partitioned or not. And and he's a, supposedly, I think it's accepted now, did have an affair with Edwina during the critical weeks of the negotiations, um, which of course perhaps really annoyed the other side to it, um, the, the Muslim League. Well, I think, you know, I think it created suspicion, and I mean that's continued to this day that that Mountbatten wasn't totally impartial, that he was more sympathetic to the Congress and Hindu. Uh, faction than he was to the Muslims. Um, uh, so, yeah, and this question would be solved if, these, if this correspondence uh, was released. And, you know, avoid speculation and some of the fantasy that probably has been around since 1947. Um, so in some ways, as you say, disinfectant is a great thing. It, you know, transparency will then, you know, clear up a lot of these issues. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact is that Nehru and the Mountbatten's were close. I mean, they shared, for example, one of the partition uh, plans with him in advance of, of 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 showing it to Jinnah. And you know, he had an unfair advantage. There's criticisms that the boundaries were changed under pressure um, when, again, Mountbatten should have been above all this. So you know, there are a lot of rather dodgy things that were going on. But, you know, whether, you know, the fact is that because um, Congress had had, had boycotted, uh, in a sense, Parliament and, and many of the leaders like Nehru had been in prison during the war, they'd lost their relationship with the British. The Muslim League had cooperated with the British uh, and, and therefore they were in a more powerful position, the Muslims, than they would have been. And Jinnah was pushing for this separate Pakistan state. Mm -hmm. Now, again, big debate whether he was this was a negotiating ploy or a genuine desire for their own state. Because after all, Hindus and Muslims had, had operated very well together for many years. It was only really during the war that the tensions began. It was almost as if people felt there had to be a sectarian element to it, um, rather than the fact it existed. Um, but, you know, again, one of the big questions is why was the policing of partition not done better? Why did we basically cut and run we, you know, we had our glorious ceremony and then we gave them the details of partition and there was chaos. You know, this could have been a much more gradual, uh, controlled affair, which is what Wavell had suggested. And Wavell, the previous governor general, I think his reputation is rising and people feel that perhaps if he had stayed, been allowed to stay, uh, the, 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 the changes would have been less. Well, we should uh, <clears throat> we should get some Indian or Pakistani historians and do a whole program on the partition, actually, one day. Yes, it's I a good really subject. Like absolutely. I'd love to do that. Um, and we'll, we've got William Dalrymple coming up later in the series, and we could perhaps ask. Well, yes, him we've, we've got. A, excuse me, we've got a few minutes left of this one, so the Zoom inevitably runs out. God, we're cheap. Um, and no, I think it's great. Forty minutes is all anyone wants to hear of us. That's that's probably true, actually. Or four, actually, if you know <laughs> us really well. 
But uh, yes, let's talk about upcoming shows. I am really excited to get William Dalrymple. He wrote the most amazing book, which has written lots, but called The Anarchy on the, uh, the East India Company and how it basically took over an entire con continent from a small office in London and then stole everything. Yes, exactly, which is now being being filmed uh, in the tradition of succession. Oh, is it? But we've also, the one I'm excited about is one of your BBC colleagues, Andy Verity, who's done a book called Rigged about the LIBOR scandal. There's a lot in the press about it at the moment. There are questions in Parliament. They're going to reopen the investigation. But this, you know, very much in the tradition of the post office scandal programme, you know, people went to prison uh, and again, powerful people were able to sort of dodge the bullet. And, and he's showing it's an international problem. But I mean, you know, I know as the agent that pressure was put on the publishers from the Bank of England, for example, to change stuff and to protect uh, senior officials there. Um, but, I, you know, that one, I think, is, again, an, an important programme. I think we need to shine light on that. Marvellous. Well, look, yes. it's a, a pleasure to be fighting this battle with you, Andrew. Look well, thank you. To another six Your months. Um, you know, uh, it's so interesting. I hope people enjoy our conversations. I think there's some really mouth-watering stuff in the next little block coming up. And uh, meanwhile... We look I'm forward... Look forward to hearing from people. I mean, we want we want feedback and um, uh, you know direction of what people want. I mean, I know yeah. we follow our own interests and um, uh, instincts, but you know it's always helpful. I think people were talking they wanted more American material, so I think we're going to be looking at JFK's assassination with a new theory, uh, and uh, certainly our podcasts on Australia have done very well. So maybe we need to find a good Australian subject. We do, I'm and sure we will. Of course, royals always seem to be um, a box office. Yes, uh, well, we can't neglect that. Um, so, yes, thank you. I need to go walk up a mountain now, but it's good to talk to you. And thanks for listening. And please subscribe on YouTube. Yes, Bye, do we do. We want to reach hundred thousand. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a Podcast World production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 